Hi everyone. So we will be continuing with the discussion of the juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. So in this uh, slides, we are going to discuss about the clinical features and uh, uh, the clinical features of this disease, uh, the differential diagnosis and the investigations. Okay, and the staging of this uh, uh, tumor. Before that, let me just talk a little bit about the uh, pathology of this tumor because it is having some clinical relevance. So, pathology of uh, uh, juvenile nasopharyngeal pathology of juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. Angiofibroma, as we already know, we have already discussed, it is made up of vascular and fibrous tissue. The speciality of the vessels of this. Uh, uh, tumor are that they are just endothelium lined spaces and there is no muscle coat. So I have put these two diagrams so that you can understand. This is the basically an artery. This is an artery here. This is the tunica intima, tunica media, tunica externa. See the uh, uh, the width of the lumen, width of the arterial wall. The arterial wall is this thick. Okay, this is the muscle coat that we have here. Okay, so this is a vein. The vein is having a smaller muscle coat compared to the artery. But if you see the uh, see the vessels of the the vessels which are uh, making up the uh, juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma, they're just endothelium lined spaces. There is no muscle coat. There is no muscle coat in these cases. Because of there is no muscle coat, these vessels do not have the ability to contract. So you cannot control the bleeding by application of adrenaline. Uh, the for the cases of uh, epistaxis, bleeding, nose bleeding, epistaxis, we try to give 1 in 30,000 local adrenaline pack. So this is basically ineffective when it comes to controlling bleeding uh, that is caused by juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. So these dots are basically, basically small bland fibroblasts. The, uh, the pinkish color one is a dense collagenous stroma. So this is how the tumor is made up of. Tumor is made up of fibrous tissue. Tumor is made up of fibrous tissue and it is having thin walled vessels with no muscle coat. So again, just confirming it. No muscle coat. Uh, so they do not have the ability to contract and you cannot control it by the application of adrenaline. Okay, coming to clinical features. Basically, we have done a good job with the etiopathogenesis. We have gone into quite a depth. So this clinical features is going to be quite easy for you. So coming to clinical features, as I've already said, clinical features consist of symptoms and signs. So the symptoms with which the patient is going to present to you, the first thing is age and sex. It is almost always an adolescent male, which we have talked about. Uh, it's a male in the age group of 10 to 20 years. It is an adolescent male, a uh, young adult. Okay. The most common way in which he's going to present to you is called profuse epistaxis and recurrent epistaxis. These are the features with which he's going to present to you. So it's profuse. It is not like a few drops of blood. The patient is going to say to you that uh, once the bleeding starts, I, I cannot stop the bleeding. And also uh, the bleeding is torrential, like almost one, two, three handkerchiefs have got totally soaked with blood. Okay. And this bleeding is recurrent, like um, it's not that I had this bleeding one month, two months, three months back. I am having from the last one week or two weeks, every day, every other day I'm having bleeding. Uh, and one more thing that the patient is going to tell to you that it is unprovoked. I did not blow the nasal picking but still the bleeding started and it is torrential so the because when any patient when the bleeding starts from the nose it is quite scary for the patient they get alarmed so they're going to come to you immediately they're not going to wait uh, any case which is having like progressive nasal obstruction they are going to wait probably but uh, a patient who is having this uh, diagnosis that patient may be having juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma the patient is going to come with unprovoked uh, profuse and recurrent epistaxis so that guy is going to present to you early okay so the and the anemia because of the lot of blood loss that happens you can say almost 500 ml of blood loss 250 ml of blood loss that much amount of blood loss happens the patient is going to definitely land up in anemia even though he is a male 
Okay, so anemia is telling you that the patient has many episodes, has already had many episodes of epistaxis. The other uh, presenting feature is a progressive nasal obstruction. So my nose is getting blocked. Initially, it is going to be unilateral nasal obstruction, and then it is going as it's going to grow the other nasal cavity. It is going to be a bilateral nasal obstruction. Because of the nasal obstruction, the patient is going to have denasal speech as if he is speaking with his nose. The palate, the nasopharynx is getting progressively blocked. So the patient is going to talk with a denasal speech. Okay, as if his nose is blocked. When you have a denasal speech, when there is cold, when there is severe cold, you have a denasal speech, right? It 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 is it appears like that. As the tumor starts growing into the nasopharynx and it starts blocking the eustachian tube, then the patient is going to present with conductive hearing loss and serous otitis media. So we have talked about all this. So let me just uh, revise this. So it is going to be an adolescent male. He is going to present with epistaxis, which is profuse, which is recurrent and unprovoked, because of which the patient is going to land up in anemia. As the tumor starts growing, patient is going to have progressive nasal obstruction and denasal speech. As uh, the tumor starts obstructing the eustachian tube, the patient is going to have conductive hearing loss and serous otitis media. Okay. Now coming to signs. So uh, uh, symptoms is what the patient tells you. Signs are what you elicit from the patient. So when you do an anterior rhinoscopy, this is basically an endoscopic picture, DNA diagnostic nasal endoscopy of this nose. You cannot see it as clearly with a with a with a headlight, head headlight or with a head mirror. But when you remove the suction out the uh, secretions which are present in the nose, uh, you will see this kind of mass. You know the water. What, what is this? this? Is like it's a smooth surface. The smooth surface. Okay, it is lobulated. So it is lobulated. Okay, it is sessile. It is not pedunculated. It is sessile. It appears fleshy mass. Okay, so this is a red, uh, purplish looking. Uh, mass will be seen so these are the various ways in which you can describe this mass in the nasal cavity with an anterior rhinoscopy posterior rhinoscopy posterior rhinoscopy by doing uh, by doing a posterior rhinoscopy is an important part of is an important part of uh, the tag of the examination of the nose um, important part of the examination of the nose the same things you are going to see this is a post nasal mirror so you are going to put a post nasal mirror and uh, uh, behind the soft palate behind the soft palate and the light from your headlight falls on it and so you can see the coena inside the coena okay so inside the, you can see the coena that is the uh, the orifice the aperture from the nose communicates into the nasopharynx you can see the post posterior end of the superior middle and inferior turbinates you can see the tubal elevation this is the eustachian tube this is the torus tubaris and the posterior surface of the soft palate and the midline of the nasal septum so all this you are not going to see in this case i'm just telling what are the structures that you can expect to see in posterior rhinoscopy you are going to see basically same same mass you are going to see posterior which is totally blocking the nasopharynx and as i have already described it is going to be sessile it is lobulated it is smooth and it's obstructing one or both coena it is pink or purplish in color we have already because of the uh, various components of the blood vessels and the fibrous tissue it may be pink or purplish in color so basically you are going to see a fleshy mass red purplish pinkish mass in the nasal cavity and the post nasal space that is where the tumor is originating from the tumor originates from the superior border of the sphenopalatine foramen which is present in the posterior part of the nasal cavity from there it grows into the nasal cavity nasopharynx Okay, as the tumor starts growing uh, further and the patient has probably presented late, stays in a very remote place probably. So, patient is presenting late to you. Uh, the other late clinical features are broadening of the nasal bridge. The first thing is the broadening of the nasal bridge, proptosis and swelling of the cheek and the infratemporal fossa. So, here you can see the uh, broadening of the nasal bridge. The nasal bridge is supposed to be small. In this patient, the nasal bridge is so much uh, broadened. This broadening is because of the tumor extending into the ethmoid sinus. Okay, ethmoid sinus is present just behind this nasal uh, nasal bones, and when the ethmoid sinus starts bulging uh, because of the tumor growth into the ethmoid sinus, there is broadening of the nasal bridge. Here you can see that there is proptosis. The the eyeball is being pushed upwards and outwards. Proptosis upwards and outwards pushing of the eyeball. 
upwards and outwards okay this is have this happens when you know uh, the tumor has gone from the spinopalatine fossa into the orbit through the infra orbital fissure and it is occupying the orbit it is occupying the orbit pushing the eyeball outwards okay once it has grown uh, from the spinopalatine fossa it has grown from the spinopalatine fossa into the infratemporal fossa and the cheek you can see this swelling here in this boy okay so this is the tumor that has grown from the infratemporal fossa uh, it is presenting in the infratemporal fossa and the cheek okay so these are the three things that you are going to see as late clinical features of juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma one is broadening of the nasal bridge because of the involvement of the ethmoids two is proptosis because of the involvement or invading the orbit third one is when it is growing into the cheek or through the uh, terigo maxillary fissure we talked about in anatomy into the infratemporal fossa you are going to have a swelling in the cheek okay and once there is involvement of the cavernous sinus from the spinoid sinus we talked about from the spinoid sinus it goes to cavernous sinus uh, the sec the third sorry third fourth and the sixth cranial nerve or second will get involved in the orbit so uh, these nerves can also get involved in juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma these are the late clinical features when the tumor is growing beyond its confines and going into the infratemporal fossa orbits and the cranium okay so this is described you know frog face deformity this is the classical presentation this is what is written in the textbooks and the literature frog face deformity when you have a combination of the nasal bridge broadening broadening of the nasal bridge proptosis and swelling of the cheek this is how a frog looks like right so there is broadening of the nasal bridge there is proptosis the eyeball is pushed outwards uh, and there is swelling of the cheek and there is swelling of the cheek if you add these three together you get a frog face deformity so here is one of the patients there is definitely broadening of the nasal bridge the eyeball is being pushed outwards and there is proptosis and the swelling of the cheek here you can probably you can see here also there is you know it has invaded the temple area okay uh, it is going in temporal area so uh, this is uh, the classical description of JNA, frog face deformity. Classical description of juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. When you have nasal bridge broadening, proptosis and the swelling of the cheek. So you have to remember this. Now coming to the differential diagnosis, any cause that is causing nasal obstruction or any cause that is causing epistaxis can come under uh, the differential diagnosis of JNA. Uh, so any nasal polyp whether it's an ethmoidal polyp anteroconal polyp inverted papilloma squamous cell carcinoma can be considered as a differential diagnosis in of a differential diagnosis of gna each of them has a different presentation ethmoidal polyps suppose it is an ethmoidal polyp it is not seen in young children anteroconal polyp is seen in children sometimes uh, but there is no bleeding okay there is no bleeding inverted papilloma is seen in 30 40 year age year old age group year age group uh, and squamous cell carcinoma 50 60 age group and uh, also there is some smoking history is there so that's how you can differentiate these things but these do things these things do come under the differential diagnosis any cause of epistaxis whether it's local like septal hemangioma septal hemangioma you can think of as one of the local causes uh, you can think about nasal picking uh, causing the little area prominent blood vessels or any systemic factors like uh, von Willebrand disease or factor 8 deficiency these things can cause systemic causes of epistaxis so these things all come under differential diagnosis okay now coming to the uh, Investigation. So this is an important uh, part. This is what is going to be asked in the exams. Investigations. That investigation is a part of the management of uh, juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. The first investigation that you write uh, always uh, tell is a contrast enhanced CT of the paranasal sinus. So this is the investigation of choice. Why? Because a CT scan shows the bony windows very well. So you can see the bony windows. Where is the bone? Uh, and also, what does the contrast enhanced CT do? If it is a non-vascular tumor, the tumor will not enhance on on giving a contrast. Okay, but if this is a, this is a basically a vascular tumor, so there will be contrast enhancement of the tumor. There will be contrast enhancement of the tumor. So 
contrast enhancement will be seen bony windows are clearly seen because of which you can see the extent of the tumor see here it is clearly seen this is the tumor this is the tumor it is a properly it is filling up the uh, spinopalatine fossa it is pushing the posterior wall of the maxillary antrum forward the arrow is showing that one so it, this is the pathognomonic sign of uh, uh, juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma and no other disease you will see this feature like the pushing of the posterior wall of the maxillary antrum forwards. This anterior bowing of the posterior wall of maxillary sinus is called the antral sign. Also, it's called the hormone miller sign. This is the pathognomonic finding in a case of juvenile asopharyngeal angiofibroma. Posteriorly, what does it do? It is, uh, it is present where the posterior, the, what is the posterior boundary of that uh, the spinopalatine fossa? It's the pterygoid plates. So when it starts invading this part, it appears as if these pterygoid plates are floating. Here you see they are attached to the base of the skull. Here you see they are there like as if they are floating. So they're called floating pterygoids. So pterygoid plates are pushed posteriorly. Also the distance in between the two pterygoid plates is also increased. So these are the features that you will see in a case of CD scan. This is a little bit of uh, advanced disease, but uh, you will definitely find whether there is any bony destruction or displacement of the bony destruction you can see you can see better with uh, CD scan the bone will be dehiscence there, there will be no continuity here you can see that the bone is continue continued uh, here but sometimes in between you know the, the bone will not the bone will be absent so you can say okay there is no bone here so it is growing through the uh, bone it is causing bony dehiscence okay so contrast enhanced CT is the investigation of choice why because you find out the extent of the tumor bony displacements uh, if the tumor is large enough, you will find uh, the classic feature that is the Holman Miller sign, which is the anterior bowing of the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus and the floating pterygoids. Okay, coming to MRI scan. MRI scan is basically for soft tissues, like how CD scan is for the bony uh, detail uh, to find out the bone, uh, whether the bone, the bone appears better on a CD scan, whether the soft tissues appear better on an MRI scan. The, the bony detail, the, the contrast with which you can see the bone is, is and but in an MRI you can see the soft tissues better. Okay, when do we do an MRI? When do we expect to do an MRI? When there is extension of the tumor, when we suspect that there is extension of the tumor either into the brain, either into the infratemporal fossa or into the orbit. Okay, when it is growing into these three uh, places, uh, we want to see what is the extent, how much it has gone into there, whether there is any, uh, whether there is invasion into this uh, brain or the infratemporal fossa of the orbit and how much of extension has happened, how much of the other structures are compromised, we will find out with uh, MRI scan. Carotid angiography is a third important uh, investigation in a case of angiofibroma. This is done pre-operatively, just before you are going to take up the patient for surgery, like tomorrow is surgery, you do it one day before. Why? Because not only will you be able to find out which is the feeding vessel of the angiofibroma, most common feeding vessel is the maxilla. But you also can do a pre-operative embolization of this vessel. Okay, they can, you can uh, use gel foam or some other material with which you can block this maxillary artery. Once you block the maxillary artery, the, 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 tumor, the tumor loses its blood supply and the bleeding from this is very, from this tumor is very less. I remember my, my assistant professors, my professors telling me that uh, when I was doing post-graduation. So before when we were operating like 10-15 years back, there used to be torrential bleed, blood loss during surgery. We, did, we had to keep 3-4-5 liters of units of blood ready. But after you do a preoperative embolization, you do not wait. Okay, If you wait for a few days, there will be again another blood uh, vessel giving blood supply to that vessel. To that uh, tumor so if you do it immediately just before uh, the surgery the most of the cases do not even require one unit of blood so that is the way this the management of juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma has progressed over time so one more important thing we have to mention biopsy and fnac is contraindicated whenever we see a mass in the nose fleshy mass in the nose actually we feel that the biopsy is the next investigation modality but when the patient presents to you a young male with profuse epistaxis unprovoked torrential okay and you do a CT scan you see this kind of feature which is which is present in the uh, telecomaxillary fossa uh, and it is causing bowing of the hand, uh, posterior wall of the maxillary antrum you do not even think of doing a biopsy because the bleeding that happens when you touch this uh, tumor is so torrential that sometimes you may even end up with
uh, very bad result on your hands. Okay, so do not touch this uh, tumor. Biopsy and FNAC is only mentioned because it is contraindicated. Okay, coming to staging of his, uh, of uh, angiofibroma, it is done by sessions at all. Uh, this is not there in the textbook, uh, Dingra, but uh, this is an important uh, topic from the neat PG point of view and also it gives a very good impression to the examiner that you can, you know what is staging, okay. So stage 1, we are divided, the, the staging of the angiofibroma is divided into 3 stages, stage 1, stage 2 and stage 3. Okay, stage 1, this is stage 1 is more... Uh, less uh, extension of the tumor, stage 2 is more compared to stage 1 and stage 3 is basically intracranial extension. Okay, so when the tumor is, what is the first place the tumor will grow because there is no least kind of uh, resistance to it, it is the nasal cavity, nasopharynx and the next goes into the uh, into the ethmoid sinuses and the other paranasal sinuses. So stage 1a is when the tumor is limited to the nasal cavity and nasopharynx. Stage 1b when it is extending into one or more paranasal sinuses. Any paranasal sinuses, whether it's an ethmoid sinus or a maxillary sinus or a spinoid sinus, once it extends into these sinuses, because they are also part of the nasal cavity, uh, so it comes under stage 1b. Okay, that is stage 1b. Stage 2 Stage 2 is, uh, how do you remember stage 2? When it is extending from the uh, spinopalatine foramen into the uh, into the uh, spinopalatine fossa, from there it is extending outward into the infratemporal fossa, from there it is extending into the orbit. So this extension, this path in which you know it goes, this path, this forms the basis of stage 2. What is stage 1 to A? When there is minimal extension through the spinopalatine foramen into the spinopalatine or the pterygomaxillary fossa. Both are actually the synonyms of the fossa. You can call it pterygomaxillary fossa, you can call it spinopalatine fossa. There is minimal extension from the spinopalatine foramen. It is extending just extending into the pterygopalatine fossa, mm -hmm. spinopalatine fossa. Then you call it stage 2A. Stage 2b, when it is filling, you know, the filling the spinopalatine fossa. When it is filling the spinopalatine fossa, uh, because it is filling the spinopalatine fossa, it will cause bowing of the posterior wall of the maxillary antrum anteriorly. It comes under stage 2b. Stage 2b also orbit. Orbit also comes under stage 2b. Remember that. Stage 2b is orbit because it comes as like, it is still within the confines of the spinopalatine fossa. Okay, it extending from the orbit via the infraorbital fissure. Through the infraorbital fissure, it is extending into the orbit, it still comes in the stage 2b. Once it has extended beyond the spinopalatine fossa into the infratemporal fossa, it comes in the stage 2c. So, stage 2a is minimal extension into the pterygopalatine fossa. Stage 2b, when it is filling the spinopalatine fossa and extending into the orbit, stage 2c is when it is extending beyond, that is the keyword beyond the spinopalatine fossa into the infratemporal fossa, it is stage 2c. Stage 3, when it is intracranial extension. Intracranial extension we already talked about, it can go into the middle cranial fossa or into the anterior cranial fossa. Middle cranial fossa is more common than anterior cranial fossa and middle cranial fossa, it extends to the spinoid sinus and uh, or directly to the middle cranial fossa floor, floor of the middle cranial fossa. So with this we come to the end of the second uh, part of juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. In the third part we will talk about the treatment, surgical approaches, you know, adjuvant treatments and we are going to talk about the uh, prognosis of this disease. Thank you everybody for the patient listening.